Hi, and welcome to Puzzling Adventures, where we look at some programming puzzles and I walk you through my process of solving them. I am Philip Lenk, and today we will start out by picking one of the easy puzzles on codinggame.com. In case you do not know it, allow me to briefly introduce the site. It is not quite entirely unlike some other competitive programming sites you might already know, like LeetCode, HackerRank, or Code Wars, in that it provides small, largely self contained practice problems, as you might encounter them in a typical coding interview. It does, however, take the gamification aspect farther than those, and it also offers some rather unique and engaging formats the others lack and which make it one of my personal favorites. There is, for instance, this rather addictive Clash of Code format, where you and a number of other participants are given up to 15 minutes to solve the same programming task. The winner is, depending on the mode, determined by who submits the first or the smallest working solution. There are code golf, optimization, and game bot programming tasks, and every few months they host a week long competition where you write an AI to pit against those of others for a completely new game. That is really educational and quite a lot of fun. Well, the puzzle I selected for today is one about prefix codes, simply because I felt it was one of the more interesting ones in the easy category that I haven't solved yet. If there is any particular puzzle on this side or any other you would like me to tackle in a future video, please let me know and I will see what I can do about it. Once you have decided on which puzzle you would like to solve and have clicked on all of the appropriate buttons, as I have done in the background, you will be greeted with this neat little overview. As you can see, on the left side of the screen we are presented with a detailed description of the problem, whereas there is an editor with space for our code on the right hand side. Up here you can freely select among the various supported languages, and you can see there are quite a lot of them, and down here you can run your current code on a number of predefined visible test cases. Once you feel confident enough, you can submit it to be tested against a number of additional hidden ones. The general structure is uniform among all tasks on the site. You are provided with some input and standard input, and you are expected to write a complete program that provides a certain output based on it. That has several advantages. You are forced to actively think about which kind of data structures would be most appropriate to represent the input data, understanding of which is an important skill to practice, and you are shielded from suboptimal interface choices. Many lead code problems, for instance, suffer from this. You are given something like a two dimensional point or some other fixed size data with a clear semantic meaning attached to it as simply a generic vector and are expected to return the same. Such issues are completely circumvented here. The disadvantage, of course, is that passing the input is now necessarily always part of the assignment, as correctly formatting the output even if that is only tangentially related to the actual problem. With that long preamble finally out of the way, let's get to actually solving the task at hand. Now, the first thing I tend to do when opening one of the puzzles is pretty much always the exact same thing. I freeze in horror, an expression of utter disgust painting my tortured face, until I manage to compose myself and delete the example code. Now, I am exaggerating, of course, but only mildly. There are several glaring issues which are always present and which I just cannot ignore. Chiefly among them are all those include directives. Not only are a bunch of them not even used, but the order makes no sense at all. That is a bit of a pet peeve of mine, which annoys me so much that I dedicated a complete and rather long blog post to that topic alone. You can find a link to it in the description below, but the gist of it is, logically sorting your includes prevents potential errors and greatly aids readability. The next obvious things that are bothering me are this, and of course, this. Jason Turner once did a really great C Weekly episode explaining why Endl is almost never what you want to write, which I will link in the description below, and I really don't know what all those C ignores are doing here. They are completely unnecessary. Choice of data types is sometimes, as on other sites, questionable at best, and yet another thing I really do not like is that using namespace std directive up here. So, I have to admit, in so small and self-contained a code, that is more a matter of taste and not a real problem. Nonetheless, let's quickly delete it all and figure out what we are supposed to do. When pressed for time, in one of the Clash of Code situations for instance, it can sometimes pay off to ignore the long explanation completely and simply scroll down to see how the input and output format are defined and try to guess the task based on that. I would not recommend it in general though, especially when learning and with no time constraints looming our buffers which is why we will now, very carefully, read the problem statement.
Given a fixed set of characters, a code is a table that gives the encoding to use for each character. A prefix code is a code with a prefix property, which is that says no character with an encoding that is a prefix, that is an initial segment, of the encoding of another character. Your goal is to decode an encoded string using the given prefix code, or say that is not possible. After that, we are given an example of an encoding for the string abracadabra using apparently this mapping, which maps A to a 1, B to a 0, 0, 1, C to a 0, 1, 1, and so on. The resulting encode will be this long string of 1s and zeros. Thus, if you are given the code above and the input of this long string of 1s and zeros, you should output the original string abracadabra. With that same prefix code, that is, the same mapping of A, B, A to 1, B to 0, 0, 1, and so on, if the input is 0, 0, 0, 0, that is, four zeros, then you should tell that there is an error at index 3. Indeed, the first three characters of this input can be decoded to give an R, but that leaves a 0, which cannot be decoded. Then we are provided with two links, one to Wikipedia, where we can find a more detailed explanation of what a prefix code is, and one to an extended exercise where you create prefix codes and don't just use them. After that, as usual on the site, we are given an input and output description, but I suggest we look at that later when implementing it, and first of all walk through the example to make sure we understand what is going on here. So what we see here is a string abracadabra and a mapping and a resulting string. What the exercise wants us to do is read just the resulting string and the, and the mapping and get back to the original string of abracadabra. So we should read this string of ones and zeros and knowing this mapping should output abracadabra. If I see that correctly, we just read from left to right and try to find one of those prefixes that matches. So we read from left, starting at the 1, and now we'd have to check if we do have one encoding that maps 1 to a specific character. Apparently we do, which is just this very first one, which maps the character 1, the prefix 1, to the character A. So what we have to do is output A, or at least remember that we would have to output A if we don't get to an error, and then throw away that prefix. We can safely throw away that prefix and just look at all that follows, because we know of this prefix property that no other code can ever start with a 1. There can't be a code that maps 1,1 one, one to E or some such thing. No, if we encounter 1 and another 1, that will be two A's. That is uniquely defined. There is no ambiguity here. So we can throw away that one and scan the next prefix. We look at the zero and then we have to walk through all of our uh, codes and see no code uh, is just a single zero. So we will now look at two zeros, which is still not a valid code. So we will now look at zero, zero, 001, the next extended prefix. That apparently is a valid code and it maps to a B. So what we do is we remember the B and we throw away the 001. Wonderful! Now we have to scan with the next uh, part of the input. That 0, again, no code. Uh, two zeros, no match. Three zeros, yay, we found a match. The last one, that is an R. So we are at up. We again throw away the three zeros and start with the next part of the code, which starts with 1, which is, which is a match which is the A. We throw that away, and so on, and so on, and in the end we will uh, have abracadabra. We do that till, till we reach the end of our string of ones and zeros. That seems rather straightforward. We can also just quickly check the error case, which is this string of four zeros, where we would also start with one zero, find no match, two zeros, find no match. Then we'd get to three zeros, which is the R, as we expected. And then we have one zero left, which matches no string, and therefore we have one zero which we cannot decode and that would be an error. Okay, that is kind of understandable. So the first probably not ideal or optimal solution I can think of is to do exactly what I just did manually, just in code. The difficult question we have to ask here is how do we store the code so we can quickly look up our given prefix and the first thing I could think of would be using some generic data structure, and probably the one we computer scientists tend to use whenever complexity escapes us otherwise, that is a hash map where we store string from one of zeros and map it to 
one of the single characters. So let's quickly try to implement that. Now there's one final thing we have to get to before actually typing in code, and that is having a detailed look in the input format, just to know what we have to read and in which order. The first line apparently is just a single integer n representing the size of our encoding table, and after that we get one entry for each of those tables, starting with the binary code as a string of one and zeros, and an integer representing the ASCII code for the character it maps to. In the final line we, fi we get that a uh, string of ones and zeros which we are supposed to decode. With that out of the way, we can actually get to coding out our solution, so let's do that. We start by including what we need, which of course is IO stream because we somehow have to read our input and output our result. And as I stated before, we might utilize a hash table, and a hash table in C is typed as unordered map. Then we need a main function to do our actual work. And in there, we first declare our variable for our code. The key type I'm going to use is std string, which might not be ideal, but it's very convenient at this point as we get our in input as a string of ones and zeros. One could use a more compact encoding here as the string is just of ones or zeros, so we could use one bit per character in it instead of just a complete character, so eight bit per character. But that is a bit overkill at this point. And the type we map to is of course a character, so char. Afterwards we need to read in how many entries there are, and the type I tend to use for that kind of thing is size t, as I'm a little paranoid and like to use the largest type available for me. <laughs> then we read it in, and then we will have to loop over all of those entries to read them into our map, which we do with a simple for loop. For each entry, we have to read the string of characters and our um, code which we map to, which we get as an integer, so we have to be careful here not to use a char for the input, but an int for the input and convert it to char before we save it in the map. So let's do that. I'm doing exactly no uh, checking for errors here, and just assume that every integer we get is a valid ASCII code. I assume we can do that at this point, but yeah, I think they even name it as in the constraints that C is smaller than 127, so within the valid range of ASCII code. Why they don't provide it as a character, I don't quite know. All right, with that out of the way, we have our input. Now we just need the string we have to decode. So. Let's quickly read that in and get to finally solving the problem as stated before. What we need for that is keep track of what we have decoded so far and our prefix, which we have not yet decoded so far. And then just iterate over all the characters, append to the prefix, look up in our map, and if we find something, throw away the prefix and append to our decoded string. So we need yet another string for the decoded and for the prefix both of which are initially empty, which is exactly what we want. Then we loop over all the characters in encoded, which we do with a simple range for loop, and first append to our prefix. Then we look up in our map if the current prefix can be found there. I think for some of you, that kind of syntax might be a little confusing. First of all, what I'm using here is not just a simple if, but an if with an initializer, meaning I first declare a variable here, which I can then use to write the condition more succinctly and which only lives within the scope of the if. The second thing that might be confusing is using find and then checking for end to see if it actually has an entry. What find returns is an iterator to an entry in the map. If no entry is found, it returns an iterator past the end, the std end iterator, which indicates that apparently there could not be found any entry in it. There are other ways we could do that. So we, there is, for instance, a member function named count. 
which returns how many entries in this unordered map are, which is 0 or 1 in case of a normal map and not an unordered multi-map. In newer versions of C++, I think from C++ 20 onwards, we also have a contains method which just returns true or false. Both of which are kind of suboptimal here because after we check if there's an entry, we actually need to access this entry. If we checked and then looked up the entry again, we would have to do two lookups in the map instead of one. Here we save this problem because we have the iterator to the entry if it exists. So given that, the first thing we have to do if we find an entry is throw away the prefix. So we can either type in prefix as the empty string or we could just say prefix.clear to clear the string. The next thing we have to do is add our found character encoding to the currently decoded string. That is, we take decoded and append the character which was mapped to. Now, for, to do that, you have to know what exactly this iterator points to, and it points to a pair of key and value. So, it first is the key, so the prefix we have used to look up, whereas it second is the value, the character we mapped to. So, we can append like this. In case we haven't found an entry for this prefix, we don't have to do anything. We just loop again, append to our prefix, and look up whether we find this new extended prefix in our map. And so on and so on till we reach the end of the string. If we reach the end of the string, we just have to check if we have decoded everything. If we have, that means our prefix is empty. We have reached the end of the string and we have not appended anything. And when we read the very last character, we apparently found an entry. So if it was not empty, we have an error. And in case of an error, we are supposed to output decode fail at index e, with e being the first index in the encoded string where the decoding fails. Now we didn't keep track of the index where it failed, but what we did keep track of was the prefix we have not thus far decoded. So to get that index, we just have to subtract the size of the complete, from the size of the complete string, the size of the prefix that was not decoded. So if the prefix is not empty, we have to output decode fail at index, and then this index, which as stated, we can just compute by saying encoded.size minus prefix.size. Otherwise, we can just output the decoded string as we apparently were successful. All right, let's quickly test this on the provided test cases. If they all get green like those first few, then we have done nothing wrong and everything worked exactly as we intended. There are apparently quite a lot of test cases, so we'll have to wait a while, but that's good because then they really catch if we do something wrong. Cool, that seems to have worked. All of the test cases are green. We have done nothing wrong. We can just assume it works and submit it to see if all the other test cases confirm our suspicions that we have actually solved our problem. Hit submit and see this loads a while because it now runs on hidden test cases and this 100% indicates that we've actually solved the problem. There's nothing wrong, everything here worked as intended. So was it ideal? Probably not. As you could see, our solution was good enough to solve all the test cases provided to us. And it was also good enough to solve all of those we couldn't even look at. So it cannot have been terribly inefficient. Nonetheless, I claim that we can do better. And before I explain to you how and thereby display my terrible drawing skills, I think I should distract you for a moment by explaining exactly where we are doing too much work and why. It all comes down to what we did here, when we chose which data type to use for representing our codes. The one we chose was a hash map, which is frequently the best thing we can hope for in practice, but it is rarely the best in theory, especially not if we cannot guarantee that we have perfect hashing. Now, perfect hashing means that every single possible key is mapped to exactly one uniquely identified slot in our hash map. That is, we can guarantee that there will never be any collisions, ever. And that, by the pigeonhole principle or some such thing, cannot be done if we have more potential key values than we have slots in our hash map. 
for the problem at hand, the space of key values wasn't exactly unlimited, but it was rather large. So strings of ones and zeros could be up to 5000 characters in length, and we can reasonably assume that the memory provided to us will not be enough to have one slot for each of those potential values. So we will have to live with collisions. And the very moment collisions enter the picture, lookup becomes more complicated. Normally we say lookup in a hash map is O1, constant time. But with collisions, that degenerates. The situation is much, much worse. Assume that every single string were mapped to exactly the same hash value, so it were put into exactly the same slot. To find any particular one of them, you would now have to iterate over all of them. You would basically have to do a linear search. So the complexity degenerates to O of n, linear time. Not constant, linear. That is rather horrifying. Well, luckily that doesn't happen that frequently in practice, so we can usually ignore it. We can just gloss over it, pretend it doesn't happen, say, look up in a hash map is O of 1 and just get on with our lives and hope for the best. But it is not the only problem we encounter here. There is another, more pressing one in this loop. Here we look up the prefix, in every single loop iteration. For each character in the input, we look up the prefix so far. And to look up the prefix, we of course have to calculate a hash value for that prefix. In this case, we do not know what exact hash function is used, but we can make some reasonable assumptions about what it will do and what it will not do. For instance, it will probably not ignore part of the prefix. If it were to do that, we would get a lot of collisions. Let's say it always ignores the first character. Then all strings that end with the same characters but start with a different one would collide and lookup would get worse, as described earlier. So a good hash function will not do that. A good hash function will consider every single character in our string to compute the final value, to have a diverse enough uh, result, uh, set of results so collisions are unlikely. So it has to iterate over all of the prefix. Computing the hash function for our prefix will not be constant time, it will be linear in the size of the prefix. And what is the worst case size for the prefix? Exactly all of the string. In the worst case, the prefix would be the complete string and therefore computing the hash function alone will be linear. Now, of course, that won't happen very frequently. With this kind of code, we basically try to get as many small prefixes as possible. So the structure of the problem kind of guarantees that won't happen very often, but it can still happen. And so maybe we can do better. The thing is, we do not have arbitrary strings. All of our prefixes follow that prefix property explained in the problem description, where no single code will ever be the prefix for another code. So maybe, just maybe, we can use set to provide something that guarantees us constant time lookup. And it turns out there's actually a data structure perfect for that. It is a try and I will now explain it with my horrible drawing skills. Enjoy. Okay, here we are with a beautiful blank sheet of paper that I'm going to ruin in a moment. Let's think about the problem we are actually trying to solve. We are given a number of key values that have a certain property that basically guarantees that some prefixes are repeated rather frequently, and we want to map it to a certain number of values. As you can see, I've prepared a list of keys and values that I've dutifully copied from Wikipedia and that also share that property. What we also have to consider here is that we are optimizing for lookup not for creation of our data structure. Creation of our data structure only happens once in the very beginning. But then we can use it to look up constantly in our decoding loop, in every single iteration and also potentially for multiple strings. So what has to be fast is lookup. Creation of the, data, of the data structure may take a little longer, that is not an issue. Well, what options do we have? One option is the one we already implemented, which is a hash table. I have prepared a hash table of sufficient size for pretty much anything we could need of four slots. Well, how do we insert into that hash table? We would have to define a hash function that for each of those strings computes one number of from 0 to 3, so 0, 1, 2, 3, one of those for each of those strings. As you can see, I have more strings than I have slots in my hash map, so at least a few of them will have to map to the same number and be stored in the same slot. As such, we cannot just store the numbers alone, 
but we actually have to store the strings with them because potentially we'll have to compare. Now I just randomly insert stuff like as if I had a hash function and I just put the two and zero pair in here and let's say the t and one pair will be stored as one and the ted and two pair will be stored as this and let's say the ten and three pair will also be stored in here. Then we store the in and four pair here and the i pair, i and five pair is stored in this slot. All right, then we are left with the in with two n and that will be stored in this slot as well. Okay, that would be one way to map it to a hash table. And now look up what happened exactly in the same way. We would compute the value for a certain hash function. So assume we want to look up what value is associated with a, value t with a key 10. We would have to compute the hash function for 10, which in our case would result in two. So we'd end up in this slot. We'd have to look up what's stored in that slot. Oh, and apparently it's more than one value. So what we have to do now is an additional string comparing. We would have to compare TED to 10. We would have to compare with TED and then we'd have to compare with 10. And then we'd actually find the value we were looking for. So what we had to do was once iterate over all of my key to store to compute the hash value and then do the same thing twice in a comparison just to find where it is. So I actually have to had to iterate three times just to find the value in the hash function. So that is not entirely ideal. Another thing you might notice here is that we store stuff repeatedly. In is stored here and it is stored here as a prefix. T is stored three times actually and the T itself is stored four times. That is a lot of storage we could maybe avoid. So another option we could have would be to actually construct a search tree. A search tree for the same thing would start with one value on the top. Let's say we start with a T and we'd actually have to store T and the value associated is with it, which is a one. And now we'd have to do a comparison of strings to insert and let's say in is smaller than T so we store it here together with its value again. Then let's say 10 is stored here with a value of 3. Then we have TED which stores the value 2 and we have 2 which stores the value of 0. You can see my drawings get worse and worse and my uh, desk is shaking, but let's ignore that and just continue with the construction of our beautiful search tree by inserting e and 5 in here. And we have the complete in, which has a value of 6, and now we have a complete constru uh, completely constructed search tree, which hopefully also is correct. I mean, in is smaller than t, in with 2 n is bigger than t, i is smaller than that. Okay, so look up in here what happened via comparisons. We would always start in the root and now assume again that we, you know, let's assume we are searching for TED. What we'd have to do is first compare T to TED. That is we iterate over TED and compare basically three characters. See TED is bigger than it, move down here and compare TED to 10. See that it is smaller, move down here and compare TED to TED and yay we have found our TED. But again what we had to do was repeatedly iterate over com our complete string to compare it. And the disadvantage of the hash map regarding storage is also retained. We store t here, we store it here, and we store it here. And that might actually be rather interesting because it's all in the same branch. Which brings us to the try. The try does not store the keys in the nodes necessarily, but in those edges. We'd start at the top and we have the following options. Our string can either start with a T or it can start with an I. Wonderful. So once we are here, we have a T or an I. The T can continue either with an E or it can continue with an A. Uh, no, that it can't. Uh, with an O. Or it can continue with an O 
and that's actually where we store our zero because t o two is exactly this word. After the e, we can be followed by an a, or by a d, or by an n. In this case, we have the word t, where we store the value 1. In this case, we have the word tet, where we store the value 2. And here, we have the word 10, where we store the value 3. We can continue in the same way on the other side. Already here, we have a complete word, the word i, which stores the value 5, and my circle was woefully inadequate for storing that, but I just increased my memory, stupid memory allocation. So after the i, we can get one more n, and there we store the value 4, because we store the value in, uh, the key in, stores the value 4. But if that was not the end of our string, but we read another n, we actually have the value 6 here. Now, the construction of that was rather tedious, I think. But what's really convenient here is lookup. Assume you want to look up which value is, is associated with the, with the string 10 again. We start in the root, we look at the first character of our 10, the t, and we only have one option to go, and that is here. Afterwards, we look at the second character of our 10, which is an e, so we move here. And now we look at the last character, which is the n, and we end up exactly at our value which we have been looking for. All we had to do was iterate once over our string and walk the tree in the process. That is the whole magic of the try. We don't actually store the, values, the prefixes twice, we store the prefixes as part of our uh, data structure in the edges and we walk those edges appropriately. Those of you well versed in theoretical computer science might notice that it's rather similar to something else and in fact the try is kind of a special case of just a deterministic state machine without any cycles. Those of you who don't know what I've just said, ignore it. It's not important to the case at hand. So with this idea of how the data structure works, let's look at how we can actually work with it in our example case. I've prepared exactly the keys and values that were written in the coding game example and the string we have to decode. So the first thing we would have to do is now construct one of those beautiful tries, uh, which by the way are also called prefix trees, which is probably a more descriptive name and maybe better. I actually don't know where the word try came from. I should look it up before I make a video about it. But regardless, let's continue and construct our try here. We start in the root and we begin with either a 1 or a 0. If we have a 1, the value behind it is an a. If we encounter a zero, the value behind it doesn't exist, but instead we can either continue with a zero or a one again. So in case we start with a one, the value still does not exist, but in case we start with a zero, we still don't have a value. Okay, let's continue here, zero, one. There we can, can read a one, which actually now is this value, and as such, what we store here is the C, because 0, 1, 1 yields exactly that value. Okay, if we encounter a 0 at that point, we have another valid code, namely this one, because 0, 1, 0 should yield D. As such, we store a D here. We have no strings of four character length, so I'll stop here in this branch and continue on that one. After a zero, we can read, after two zeros, we can read again either a one or a zero. In case we've read the one, what we've reached is zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and that maps to B, so we store a B here. In case we've read a zero, 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 three zeros, we have this last code which maps to an R. And that is our complete try. We have every single one of those uh, mappings encoded in this little tree. Starting from the root, we walk the characters of our key, 011 for instance, and we end up exactly at the character it maps to. 
by walking through the key once. Not computing a hash value, not dealing with collisions, just walking through the key and the tree at the same time. So let's quickly do that with all of my Abracadabra string down here. Oh, well, why am I doing that? So tedious. Okay, we start with a prefix of one. We look at the one. We were currently in this position at the start. We walk down to this. We have an A. Yay. And then we can throw that away. Look at the zero again. Now, once we have reached a character, we know that we have to look up the next key now and therefore would have to start from the beginning. So we start again here and now walk to this node because we read a zero. We do not need that zero anymore because we have remembered where we are. And we can only get there by reading a zero. We can only get to one node with one specific prefix. So we don't have to keep track of the prefix manually. It is enough to keep track of where we are in the tree. And we are currently here, so we read another zero, which gets, it, gets us to this node. Beautiful. Still no dice, nothing to decode, so we read a one. Reading a one gets us to this node. So we throw away the one. We recognize, oh yeah, we have actually reached the leaf node. We can output the B and start again at the beginning. Once again, we are at the top and we read a zero. So we again reach this specific node. Throw away the zero, read the next zero. Once again, reach down here. Throw away the zero, read another zero. Now we reach this node because we read three zeros, which is again a leaf node. So we can remember the R from up, throw away that zero and start again from the beginning. Once again, we start at the root and now read a one, which again brings us to an A, which is a leaf node. So we output A, start again at the beginning, read a zero, go to this node, read a one, go to this node, read another one, go to this node. So throw away that prefix, output a C. Start again from the root, read a one, output an A, throw away the one, start from the root. You get the idea, but I still do it till the end because I, well, just because. So we start a zero, end in this node, read a one, end in this node, read another zero, end here, which is a D to no one's surprise, and we can delete all those characters. And we start again. Read a one, output an A, start again. Read a zero, read a zero, read a one. Output a B, throw away the characters. Read a zero, read a zero, read a one. Abracadab. Seems like I've done an error, but let's ignore that again. Abracadab. Ah, I seem to have somehow skipped an R somewhere in between. But that's okay, I probably just mistyped that string. And it's just for, to illustrate the idea, and I think that was done well enough, or so I hope. All right, with that newly acquired knowledge, let's see if we can actually do any better. So first step, of course, is deleting everything we wrote. And after that, we can get to actually implementing the try. Now, we could do it as a class with a hard-coded value type of char, because we really don't need anything else here and we shouldn't overdo it. But if I see an opportunity to pointlessly generalize without any meaning, and I don't take it, would I really be able to call myself a C++ programmer? I guess not, so let's template it just to be sure. Now, the try we are going to implement is not a generic try, but a very special case. The key values will only consist of zeros and ones. And that is usually called a bitwise try, so we'll use that name as well. And with all of that boilerplate out of the way, let's get to actually thinking about what we need. If you remember my drawings from earlier, you'll know that a try is a tree and the tree stores values in its nodes. And the nodes also, if they don't have any values, will have to store some kind of references, pointers to children nodes 
if they exist. Now, in our case, we have either the value or the pointers, never both. But that's not generically true, and we could consider it and store a variant of those two things, or a union, but that would unnecessarily complicate the code, and I've already done that with the template, so let's really not overdo it and just store both of those things and disambiguate when we need it. So we'll add a simple node struct, which of course stores the value as a value type. But no, it can't actually do that like this, because we don't always have a value. Sometimes we have a value, sometimes we do not. In our, all of our interior nodes, we won't have any values. So we can't store a value directly, but what we could store is an optional value, which is either there or not. And this will not compile as it is, because we of course do have to include the appropriate header, which is named optional, as you might have guessed. The next thing is the reference to all those children nodes, and we have to think about how we will do that. The easiest way would, not the easiest, the one way would be to use raw pointers, manually allocate anything, and then manually delete it on destruction, but that would introduce a complication of memory management here, and there are types in the standard libraries that help us to prevent that, and we can simply use a unique pointer, which does all of this allocation and deallocation for us. It does have certain disadvantages in a tree structure, though. On destruction, the root node will be destroyed. If it stores its children as a unique pointer, what this will do in its destructor is cause the destructor of its children. Their destructors will cause all of the destructors of all of their children in turn, and so on and so on. So we will get a recursion depth for our destructor of the height of the tree, which could be kind of detrimental in real life. In our case, the trees probably won't be, that, won't be that high and we can just ignore it for the sake of simplicity. So we store two of those unique pointers to other nodes. As we store two, and we probably want to use indexing and not some conditionals to know which one we access, I'll use an array for those. And again, this won't compile because we haven't included the appropriate headers yet. Array is defined in array, and unique pointer is defined in memory, just in case you didn't know. All right, now all of our values have disappeared again, and we can continue on. Now we have to find what an node is, and of course we need at least one of those, because we have to start our tree somewhere. So we start with one node and name it root. The more perceptive of you might have realized that that again is not the ideal choice. We know beforehand that the root value will never st the root node will never store a value. It will only have pointers always. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense to have a tree at all. Now, we could have instead just stored the two children and not the value, but that would have prevented uniform handling of all nodes, and it would have somewhat complicated the code again. In a real code base where I wanted to get every ounce of performance, I might have done that. Here, when it's more supposed to be illustrative than anything else. I'll ignore that and just store a normal, normal node. With that out of the way, we actually have all the data we need. We have nodes and theoretically many of them. What we do, now, do need now is to think about what we actually have to do with a try. And there are at least two operations we need to be able to uh, apply on it. One thing is we have to actually insert something into it. And the other thing is we have to find something. We don't have to do a generic find here, though, because we never actually search for a specific complete key, but instead we walk the try from the root with one character at a time. So what we need is a way to get the root node and then walk it downwards. Let's start with the insert, because that's more straightforward and doesn't involve um, adding something to node. The insert will not return anything. We could have returned the point where it's inserted, but I think we won't need that for now, and we can add it later if desired. What we have to pass to insert is, of course, the key where we want to insert and the value that we do want to insert. There are many choices how we could um, pass those parameters. As we are getting the key value still as just a std string with zeros and ones, 
we use a string view because we just want to look at it, but one might consider adding that, uh, changing that to take some other type that's more compact as stated earlier because we only have one bit per character in there actually. All right. Again, for the value type, we have multiple choices. I use the easy and rather generic one here right now by passing it as a const reference. But now that said, of course, could also be done better because if I just pass it as a const reference, I prevent anyone from moving the key into my, uh, into my data structure. This way it will always be copied. Which is fine here because we only use a char, but in general it's something to consider. Okay, so how do we actually insert? We have to walk the tree until we find the position where we would insert and then just set the value of that node to the value we wish to insert. Walking the tree is rather straightforward if we have it completed. We just start at some point, walk, look at the current key value or the next character in the key and then either walk to the left or to the right. So follow the child, children zero pointer or the children one pointer. There is one additional complication here in that the path to our, root, to our leaf node where we want to insert might not actually exist. We might try to walk in a direction where there is no node yet and then we'd have to create it. But that's pretty much all the complication we have here. So to do that, we just start at the root and keep track of where we currently are. So we need a variable for that current and we set it to the root pointer but as it's a unique pointer and we just want to use a raw pointer here with no ownership transfer, we have to use get. Okay, with that given, we iterate over all values in our key. And now we have to either walk to the left pointer, the point at position zero, or the point at position one. Which one depends on this character, and this character is of course an ASCII character, not a zero or one. So we first have to convert it to a zero or one. And we can do that simply by, by subtracting zero here. So not the value zero, but the ASCII value of zero, because if we take the ASCII value of zero and subtract the ASCII value of zero, we get zero. The ASCII value of one is exactly one above the ASCII value of zero, so subtracting zero from that again will give an index of one. So zero will be our left child, one will be our right child. All right, with that given, we have to check if the ch child actually exists and create it otherwise. So if not current children IDX, so if it's a null pointer, then we have to create it. And we create it with make unique and have to say which type it is, obviously. And once we are here, we know either the child existed earlier or we just created it, so we can now set our current pointer to point to that new child. Again, as it's a unique pointer and we just want a non-owning raw pointer, we will have to use get here. If we reach the end of the loop, we have walked the tree down and have arrived at the leaf where we want to set the value to, so all we need to do now is set the value. Notice again that I have done no error checking at all. If someone passes a key which doesn't contain zeros or ones but some other character, this code would have absolutely horrifying undefined behavior and might start World War III, a pandemic, or just set your computer on fire, anything. So please don't do that in practice. But for this case, just for illustrative purposes, I'd ignore the error handling. All right, we've got something for insert. Now we need to do all of our finding. For that, as stated, we need a way to get to the root of the tree and then we just walk it. We could just ignore all uh, safety measures and make the code down there, do the same indexing with the children as we've done up here, or we could add a method uh, to a node that does the checking for us and just walking. And I'd probably go with the ladder because it looks a little bit more beautiful. But first of all, we need to get to the root of the tree and I just call the function for that begin because it's kind of like standard containers in that way. And what we return is root.get. Again, a non-owning pointer. 
if we just look at it, we shouldn't change it. And as I added const here, they should not be able to change the values either. Of course, that doesn't actually prevent all of those problems because const is not transitive. So if they access the children via the pointers, they can't modify the pointers, but they can modify what is pointed to, which could be a problem. But again, who cares about safety in a simple example problem? I probably do, but let's ignore that. <laughs> then we need a method in, in node that gives us the next node. Depending on a character. That does all of that neat little, little stuff we did here, computing the index. What it does not do is the checking. We just return a null pointer in case we would walk into a null pointer, so I'll let my user check that. Again, probably not the best interface choice, but not my concern. <laughs> now, at least. Cool. I think that's all we need, so now we can actually implement our main function, which looks rather similar to what we had before. Now, instead of the hash map, we create our try. Then we still have to read how many entries we do have. And we still have to loop over all the entries. Now we have to Again, read every entry and insert into it into our try, not into our hash map, into our try, so we won't use the bracket operator, but we use our insert function. Nothing special there. Oh, by the way, in is not okay currently because we haven't included iostream yet, so we should probably do that. All right, with that, all of our code is read and I wonder why they still complain about the integers there and the insert, but I'll wait up for a moment here. Declared here, you want to, did you mean SQL? Ah, because I can't type, obviously. Where did I mistype? Here, I forgot to see. Okay, happens to the best of us, I hope. So, with that out of the way, we have to read the string, we have to decode again, and then we have to iterate over it once more. All right, this time we won't save our prefix. So we won't know how long the prefix is we haven't decoded if we don't keep track of how long we've walked before decoding. So we'll have to keep track of how much of our string we have decoded for that error message we have to output. So. Of course, we do need the decoded string, forgot about that almost. And then we need some counters for decoded cars and not yet decoded cars. The names could be better, I guess, but who am I to judge? I've just written them. With that, again, we iterate over all of our characters in the encoded and walk our try. Oh, but to walk our try, we first know, need to know where we are. So again, we get a pointer to it by calling our beautiful begin function. This gives us the begin. I wonder why it's still com they still complain about it. Uh, no member named get. Ah, yeah, of course, uh, root is not a unique pointer here, so we have to just Give and pass the address directly. Sorry about that. Totally messed that up. All right. Now, again, we have to walk our try, so we say current 
is exactly the thing we get when we call current next with the current character. Then we have to, of course, remember that we have one more node yet decoded char. Oh, and we forgot to mark our function as const, despite it not modifying anything. So we got a complaint there. Wonderful. With that given, if the current has a value, we have reached one of the codes, have to append it to our decode it, and have to start again at the beginning. So if current value, if we have a value at the current node, then we have to say decode it, punct, uh, append value, current value. We have to say current is try dot begin again. So we can we'll start again at the root. Um, why does it complain about that one? Or is it just, ah, of course, it's an optional, so we have to dereference. Okay. We also have to keep track of all of our wonderful indices. So we now have to say decoded chars plus equals not decoded chars because those not decoded chars are now decoded and the not yet decoded chars will be zero. And I somehow used singular here, which is not beautiful, so I think simply adjust that quickly. And when we are done, all we have to do is check if we have any not yet decoded chars. If we don't ha if we have any not yet decoded chars, that will be an error, and we once again have to output decode fail at index, and then we have to output that index. That index is now, we don't have to compute that index anymore because we have decoded chars, which is exactly the number of, code of characters of our key which we managed to decode, and not key prefix, you get the idea. And otherwise, we just output what we have decoded. Um, but we <laughs> try to see out of course, decode it. And that? should hopefully work. And it doesn't. Why doesn't it work? It doesn't work on the missing first character test case. Let's have a look at that. The missing first character test case should fail with decode failed index zero because it starts with a zero and a one, that's okay. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, and that is not a prefix of anything. Oh, okay, that is, but the general idea, if I get that correctly, is that we start with something that isn't even in the tree. So we walk the prefix, but we end up in a node that, is, that has no children and no value. So what we totally neglected here was checking if the next value actually existed. So in this case, we have to check if not current, if we haven't gotten an actual neighbor there, then we have to just break the loop because then we have an error and nothing changes about how much we, we have decoded or haven't decoded yet. So let's try that again. Looks good, it passed the test case that previously failed and there it failed again with test case number seven, which is no table. What exactly is that? Let's have a look at it. Huh. In this case, our tree is completely empty. And what it should do is fail at index zero. What it did do was not output anything at all, which is what our code should do. Let's have a look. We insert into our try exactly nothing. Our try has a root node. Our try iterates over the encoded. It breaks. Huh. And now, of course, I broke too early because now I've read the first character and then I checked if I managed to walk anywhere. I did not, so I broke before actually noting down that I have looked at one character. So the order of those two is reversed. You can see those are some pretty decent test cases if they can't catch those things and be clear enough that I can immediately see the problem. So let's hope we got it better this time. No table, the test case. Yeah, we managed to pass that one.
and we managed to pass them all. Let's see if we can also pass the hidden validators. And yes, we did. So we do have an other solution. Is it better? I honestly don't know. I mean, theoretically it should be because of all the stuff about hash maps I told you earlier about. But it also has its own few problems like storing too many values that shouldn't even be there and walking around in memory. So I can't really say for certain. And in that case, the best thing we can possibly do is measure. Okay, what you're currently looking at is quickbench.com, which is a really awesome website. It is intended to quickly and simply compare the performance of two or more code snippets, and that is exactly what we wanted to do next. To do it, it uses Google Benchmarking's background, which we also could have set up locally, but this website takes care of all of that setup for us and we can just focus on the code we need to write, which is really convenient. All we need to do is write our benchmark and then click on that little button up here. After a moment, we will be presented with some neat little graphs comparing the performance. That is really wonderful and you also can support this website on Patreon, so I'll give you a link to it in the description below. With that out of the way, let's look at what we actually did. To add a benchmark, we have to provide a static function that takes a st benchmark state as a reference parameter. That state is then used to iterate over the part we actually want to measure. You normally do not want to measure everything. In our case, for instance, the setup stuff is done only once. We insert our code into a hash map once, and then we can use it to decode as many strings as we would like. So the stuff actually interesting to us is the decoding performance, not the setup performance. So we put all of the setup before that loop, and only the stuff inside the loop is measured repeatedly to get an indication of how it performs. So what we put in here was exactly what we had on coding game, that decode loop where we enter the prefix and then find in the map and so on. The only thing of note here is the do not optimize down here. The thing is, if we never read the value we wrote into the decoded string, so if we can never observe it and the compiler can prove it, then the compiler may just throw decode it away. And not only decode it, but all the code needed to produce it, which is, in our case, all of the code. So if we didn't tell the compiler that decoded is important, our benchmark would be rather meaningless. So with this do not optimize, we guarantee it thinks we actually read the value and it may not optimize it. That is rather important. The stuff before it is just setting up the encoding and the string for one example. I copied the largest example from coding game painstakingly and, well, just inserted the codes manually into a hash map. That example decodes to lower ipsum, just in case you want to check it. I did the same thing for um, the hash map and for the try, and I added a third solution just to have one more data point to compare against. For that, I used a map instead of a hash map, which is a search tree, most of the time a red-black tree, and should, if my assumptions are correct, perform slightly worse than the hash map. It's not really necessary here, but Every data point to compare against is a win for our benchmark. So what we need to do now is click on Run Benchmark and wait for our results and see if our performance is actually decent. And here the results are, and luckily enough they seem to be exactly what I expected. Larger bars here mean longer run times, so the smallest bar is the one that wins, and the smallest bar seems to be the try, and by a lot. My second assumption, that the hash map performs better than the map, seems to be true as well. Here you can see that the hash map seems to have performed 1.5 times faster than the map solution, but funnily enough, 15 times slower than the try solution. So actually thinking about what special cases we have here and where we were doing too much work paid off tremendously. And that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching. From this point onward, I'll just do the usual YouTube begging, so if you're bored by that sort of thing, feel free to end the video now. If you don't, however, and you enjoyed it, or maybe even derived something of value from it, please know that a single like can really make my day. What's even better is all suggestions for how I can improve my content or myself. So I'm eagerly looking forward to all your constructive criticism, your destructive criticism, and your threats of murder in the comments below. See you next time!